Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning once again to the third session of the EBII Africa Investment Risk and Compliance Summit. We've had an exciting session uh, this morning. We had uh, the, uh, Her Excellency Dr. Um, Amani Abu Zaid and His Excellency Wamkele Mene joining us uh, alongside the, uh, the Group CEO, uh, Managing Director of Zenith Bank PLC to discuss the African economic outlook. Uh, we also had, uh, after that session, we had a second section on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, we had Ebenezer Soka alongside uh, Dr. Fofak, and that was an, another exciting uh, conversation. Um, at the moment, we have um, the second keynote uh, discussions, and then we're going to go into a Q&A session. So I, I'd like to, first of all, introduce the Right Honourable uh, Lord Paul Boating, who's a former UK cabinet minister and high commissioner to South Africa. Uh, Lord Boating became um, the UK's first black cabinet minister in May 20, uh, 2002, uh, when he was appointed as a chief secretary to the treasury. Uh, following his departure from the House of Commons, he served as a British high commissioner to South Africa from March 2005 to May 2009. You're very welcome, um, Honorable much. Lord Boating. I would also like to introduce and welcome His Excellency Papa Owusu Ankoma, the Ghana High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. His Excellency Papa Owusu Ankoma is a senior Ghanaian political figure, statesman, and a lawyer. He's, he, was a point, he was a prominent member of the Kufu administration between 2001 and 2008, and during which he served in a record number of senior ministerial positions. He has served as a Minister of Parliamentary Affairs, Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Minister of the Interior, Minister of Trade and Industry, and Minister of Education, Science and Sports. It's an honor to have you also, um, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajua. Thank you. So at this point, I will first of all um, call uh, uh, Honorable Lord Boating again, um, introduce him again to give us the first keynote. Uh, which after which we will go straight to um, His Excellency um, Papa Wusu Ankuma. So, Honorable Lord Boating, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ajua. We convened virtually at this summit at a critical time for Africa and the wider world. It's a time of both hazard and opportunity. And I think it's worth reflecting on the opportunity, first and foremost, the opportunity that Africa presents in terms of its investment potential. I'm an unashamed uh, cheerleader for Africa, for Ghana, having been brought up uh, on the continent in Ghana in my uh, early, early years. And what I see in Africa is a massive market opportunity uh, for the wider world, for Africa. Uh, we need to just look at the facts, you know, look at the statistics. What do they tell us? The world's uh, fastest growing um, region uh, over the past uh, decade uh, in terms of its population uh, in, it will be what? 1.7 uh, a billion uh, people by 2030, uh, an estimated six Point seven trillion uh, worth of dollars in consumer and business uh, spending, uh, and a continent that has been embarked uh, over the past decade and more on a program of reform, structural reform in terms of its governance, uh, reform in terms of, of its uh, financial institutions, uh, a continent which is, whilst in one sense the oldest continent, the cradle of mankind, is in another sense the youngest continent in terms of its demographic. That too presents both a challenge and an, uh, an opportunity. The challenge uh, being uh, that uh, we face uh, by 2040 an expected shortfall of some 50 million jobs and livelihoods. Um, 17 million small and medium-sized enterprises have unmet financing needs. That itself presents an opportunity. 
uh, for would-be uh, investors uh, in those businesses. Uh, and least we forget, uh, you know, a recent survey of entrepreneurialism globally uh, found that when you asked uh, Africans about entrepreneurship, 80% of the population of the continent said that entrepreneurship was a good career opportunity. That makes entrepreneurship uh, a, a major asset uh, for uh, the continent in terms of its young people in particular. And the recent uh, pandemic uh, has in fact uh, highlighted uh, that. Since uh, the beginning of the uh, outbreak of COVID-19, uh, young entrepreneurs and SMEs have been actively involved in developing innovations to combat the potential effects of the virus on African countries. Whether you're talking about uh, what they call solar wash, which was a, a sun-powered, touch-free water dispenser, which was developed in Ghana, uh, triage tools in Nigeria, Diagnose Me, which was a COVID-19 remote screen screening platform that was developed in Burkina Faso, young Africans are conceiving ingenious local solutions to help the spread of disease. Now, take um, uh, what, what's been happening in, in Senegal, uh, where the Institute of Pasteur Dakar in, uh, in Dakar has developed a, a prototype for a 10-minute COVID-19 diagnostic uh, test. And if those uh, innovations were to be uh, commercialized and scaled up, such innovations could create more employment uh, on the continent. And if you just take as an example, the pharmaceutical field, according to the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, 16 million jobs are lost on the continent by importing pharmaceutical products worth $14 billion. Uh, and that, that, that gap could be met if we were to invest and see investment generated in the pharmaceutical sector in, in Africa, which presents a real opportunity, along with a number of, of other key areas. I take uh, agribusiness uh, as uh, an, an example, uh, investment in the infrastructure needs of the continent, where there is a real infrastructure gap. Uh, and you see that gap uh, presenting opportunities uh, for external uh, foreign uh, direct investment, but also and importantly, and I think this is a, a key message at this time, uh, in Africa we have to get better at ourselves identifying uh, for African uh, capital opportunities to develop uh, the uh, continent in terms of its economy and to uh, create those much needed uh, job uh, opportunities. And of course, the Africa free trade area presents a unique opportunity in that respect. It will be the largest free trade area in the world. Uh, and that is something in which Africa can take, can take pride. And the challenge now is to make sure that we move uh, from plans, and there are we have many plans uh, uh, on the continent, we move from plans to implementation. Uh, and I think it's that implementation that needs uh, to be uh, the focus of real partnerships between the private and uh, the public uh, sector uh, on uh, the uh, continent. Uh, and that brings me, I think, to, to a key area which should be for would-be investors on the continent, uh, a real uh, source uh, of uh, optimism. And that is the commitment, the continuing commitment of African governments, and Ghana is a classic example of this, uh, to creating an enabling environment uh, for, uh, for investment. Uh, successive governments uh, in, in Ghana have committed uh, themselves, and this government has taken it uh, to uh, another uh, level entirely, to creating an enabling environment uh, for, uh, for business. What does that mean in practice? 
It, it means ensuring uh, that there is a, a transparent and reliable uh, regulatory uh, environment. It, it means uh, creating uh, the necessary uh, appetite uh, on the part uh, of uh, local populations for investment, public investment, uh, into uh, infrastructure that facilitates, that facilitates uh, trade. So all those things that are happening all over the continent uh, should give rise uh, to a sense of hope and optimism uh, at, uh, this, at, at this time. And I would add to that uh, what we can, I think, genuinely describe uh, as a real commitment uh, to building on the gains that have been made in recent years by the Africa Union and by the regional uh, entities in tackling the issue of security and conflict. No one pretends that that isn't an issue for, uh, for business. Of course, business is concerned and has to be concerned uh, to have a secure environment in which uh, to make investments. But if you look at the Africa Union's role in uh, peacekeeping, uh, if you look uh, at the commitment of African states uh, to peace processes in areas of uh, conflict, their willingness to step up to the plate in order to protect and preserve democratic institutions and promote reform, that ought to be a cause of uh, some uh, degree of satisfaction, not complacency, but some degree of satisfaction. Uh, because the reality uh, is uh, that more and more countries in uh, Africa are now reaping the benefits of what I would call uh, the uh, democracy uh, dividend. Uh, Ghana is a classic example of fully functioning parliamentary democracy, uh, where there is a contention, of course, proper contention around ideas and policy, but where there is a commitment uh, to uh, upholding uh, the, con the uh, constitution. What does that mean in practice for would-be investors? It means that you can rely on those Pan-African institutions and regional in institutions to intervene when there's conflict. And let me face up to an immediate issue that concerns us all in uh, terms of investment in the Sahel to recent events uh, in, in Mali. Uh, you saw Africa, you saw ECOWAS move and is moving as we speak readily uh, to seek to resolve the situation uh, in, in that country. So business should take some heart uh, from, from that. Foreign investors should take some heart uh, from that. And I'd begin to wind up by making, by making this point. Yes, of course, there is risk. Uh, but that risk can be mitigated. It can be mitigated uh, by effective uh, due uh, diligence. It can be mitigated by really understanding the market in which you are seeking to uh, uh, enter by identifying reliable local partners, by addressing those issues of security uh, with risk mitigation strategies that are rooted in an understanding of the geopolitical reality of the continent, understanding its diversity, understanding the importance uh, of culture on the continent, understanding the importance of developing relationships with uh, local uh, uh, people and local uh, institutions uh, and ensuring uh, too that you respect local traditions, uh, that you respect uh, the uh, uh, steps that have been taken uh, in, in recent years uh, to bring about uh, uh, reform and that you relate to uh, uh, those institutions and, indivi and individuals in a way that is rooted in true partnership. Let me give you just uh, one example uh, in terms of the extractive uh, industries. Uh, yes, there are huge opportunities uh, for extractive industries uh, on, on the continent, 
But the best way to secure uh, the extractive uh, industry uh, sector is by developing local strategies that benefit the local community, that involve the local, the local community. So it's not a question of armed guards and fences, but it is a question of winning hearts and mind by giving local people a sense that they are going to obtain some real benefits in terms of, uh, of employment. Also, and importantly, uh, everyone paying their fair share of tax. Uh, internal resource mobilization, uh, the reform of the taxation uh, system, uh, is a crucial part of creating uh, that uh, enabling environment on the continent. And the good news upon which I can end uh, this part of, uh, of my contribution to this discussion is that it's happening. Those partnerships between civil society and the private sector, those partnerships between the public and the private sector are taking root uh, on the continent, are producing uh, real, real benefits. Uh, and what we need to do, and the benefit of a summit such as this, is to spread the word, uh, but also, and importantly, to share uh, good, uh, uh, good, good practice. You know, Adjua, there is a, 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 a saying uh, that we have uh, in uh, the uh, Akan uh, uh, tradition, uh, that if you come late to the kitchen, you don't have to break so many pots. So <laughs> what, what that means is we can learn from the experience of others. Uh, we can learn from the experience of, uh, other, uh, of other continents. Uh, we can uh, learn uh, and share our own experiences uh, to make sure uh, that when we come to the kitchen, uh, not only uh, do we not break as many pots, but that we create a good, productive and sustaining final product. Thank you. Thank you very much. That um, um, Right Honourable Lord Boating, uh, that, that was a very powerful um, opening keynote there. Thank you very much for that. And uh, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, of protocols observed. Um, I just wanted to, for those that are joining us late, I just wanted to also mention that this annual summit is focusing on helping African businesses and governments improve their due diligence in order to attract the right investment from within the continent of Africa and outside the continent of Africa. So at this stage, I'm going to uh, introduce and welcome um, His Excellency Papa Owusu Ankoma, the Ghana High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland uh, to deliver his speech, after which we'll go into a Q&A session. You're welcome and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Adjoa, for having me. And uh, my regards to my big brother, Lord Boatin. And I must say that presently, I would say that uh, economic challenges that we are facing globally, very grave, having regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. In terms of Africa, we have been greatly affected because of the recession. However, when it comes to its real impact on the population, I, I dare say that we are faring better than other parts of the world, particularly Europe. And over the past few years, I mean, uh, the continent has been growing, you know, uh, GDP rate of about 3.7%. And we know that with this COVID, it's anticipated that, well, it may go well below 2%. And even our GDP per capita, which has been growing and now average of $1,170, will also show a decline. And of course, Africa, we've had this uh, unemployment because yeah, we have invariably a large part of the economy being informal. So with the slowdown in economies, we are going to be uh, very much affected. However, I mean, I, I say that 
when it comes to opportunities, you know, Africa probably is the continent of the 21st century. So how do we make progress? Of course, over the years, Africa, as Lord uh, Boati said, has been undergoing a lot of reform. Uh, but presently, we've come to realize that, look, we need, as it were, to see ourselves as a group of countries with one common agenda. So it's interesting that uh, just uh, last Monday or so, African Continental Free Trade Area Office was opened in Ghana. I mean, and it's unprecedented if you consider that after the establishment of the OAU, probably this is the greatest step that Africa has taken, you know, 54 countries out of 55 signing on to AFTA with about 26 countries ratifying. And from January, we're just going to have probably the largest, the largest common uh, or free trade area uh, in the world. And uh, having the greatest number of countries apart from the WTO. So this is an opportunity for us as Africa. Now I say that indeed African experts, you know, have been looking within Africa for our own economic development models that will take into account our social cultural setting. But through science, technology, innovation, and with a strong note of research, we are gradually shoring up agricultural development efforts in order to feed our people and to become less dependent on food imports. And furthermore, you know, uh, we are using very cost effective technologies to overcome challenges that we face. And uh, the example is the recent, uh, with the recent COVID, as Lord Boatin said, where young Africans through entrepreneurship are using innovation to tackle this COVID problem. So I say that the potential is there. And fortunately too, we've all come to recognize as a continent that we have a human capital competency deficit. So we are improving upon our educational system. And because capital is becoming a challenge for us in terms of education, various countries are introducing measures that are improving access and costs. And I will give the example of Ghana, for instance. I mean, we have a free secondary school system now. It's taking a substantial proportion of uh, our expenditure as a country. But we consider that to be a priority because we believe that in terms of human capital, we need to build it up. Now, and major part of Africa is made up of uh, small and medium enterprises, okay? And capital is a major, major challenge. Now, I believe in almost all our countries, we are making capital accessible to SMEs, you know, and in the case of Ghana, I can say that just recently, over the past two or three years, efforts have been made to make capital accessible to small and medium enterprises at a cheaper cost. And that is, that is, that is uh, uh, something. I'm just making these points to emphasize that 
Africa itself is taking steps to improve the lives and the economies. And that also then provides some opportunities. I mean, as High Commissioner to uh, the UK from Ghana, I've been faced with so many questions myself. Almost every African mission here is organizing trade and investment fairs annually. We talk, we appeal, but of course, the private sector itself, in, in, in the global private sector, those with the money, they are reluctant. I asked them, so, well, you know, we are not sure stability. And I said, look, talk about Ghana. Since 1993, we've had a democratic constitutional democracy. Not only that, we've been able through the ballot box to change governments to opposition for about, for about three times. There's constant reform. I mean, uh, there's security of investment. No uh, person's investment can be appropriated by the state unless we state that reason. And even until you pay compensation. I mean, so we are doing almost everything. But the private sector is shy. But I believe that globally, Africa is the continent where you can have the highest dividend on capital. And one advantage to when it even comes to human resource, I mean, you go, out, you go all over Europe, North America, you have the African diaspora. I mean, let, let me talk about the UK. Lord Watin is a UK citizen. Yes, he has some connection with Africa, particularly Ghana. And we have so many of European nationals also having this connection to Africa. So when it comes to understanding what needs to be done in Africa, you've got a veritable source, relatively free. And in, in, I note that in Ghana now, we have a lot of multinationals that are engaging their staff, senior staff, from the diaspora mm. in Europe and North America. Mm. And that's, that's also an opportunity. Mm. So I, I dare say, and now with AFTA, can you imagine? Countries in Africa ought to be ready for it. So when you invest in Africa, for instance, in the automotive industry, apart from getting an opportunity of getting a ready market, you know, with one common tariff in the future, you also have a very competent human resource at the least cost globally. And these are opportunities. These are opportunities. We have a lot of SMEs, even those exporting agricultural products who need capital. We have opportunity for joint ventures, even in the agricultural sector. And in Ghana, we have one joint venture like that uh, with a, a UK company. Yes, that is exporting to Europe, particularly to the UK. And it's one of the highest, the highest employers in Ghana, Blue Skies. Mm. So I'm saying that the opportunities are legion, even in the educational sector. When we're talking about free secondary school education, where we're talking, we need science equipment, there's an opportunity for investment in that area. And I will be the first to admit that, look, um, 
leadership is one key, key, key factor when it comes to human existence and human endeavor. But I dare say that you now have a crop of leaders in Africa who are constantly demonstrating that, yes, we now have a leadership that is very much committed to leadership standards globally. And I've demonstrated it amply. So what we now need, when it comes to infrastructure, for instance, it's tough. I mean, uh, from Ghana, you're going to certain countries in Central Africa. You have to come to Europe before you get there. In fact, even going by road through Africa, it becomes difficult. So we have the opportunity for infrastructure, roads, railways, bridges, electricity, telecommunication, including broadband, et cetera, et cetera. These are opportunities. These are opportunities. And for me, I am saying that, look, they talk about corruption. Yes, I agree that we have corruption in Africa. But over the years, you've seen governments working to clamp down on corruption and to ensure that corruption doesn't pay. So you have, uh, for instance, Nigeria trying to get monies that have been stolen and deposited in banks in the UK and other parts of Europe being repatriated back home. And those who are supposed or who have been alleged to have committed corrupt acts are facing the full rigors of the law because the judicial system is working. For me now, I say that Africa is ready. There's more opportunities. You can have higher returns on investment. Yes, in terms of political risk, I agree there's political risk. I mean, the recent example of Mali. But in the case of Mali, you have the African Union, ECOWAS, individual countries, condemning and putting Mali and its present leadership, you know, on the table and telling them that, look, we are not dealing with you until you restore constitutional rule. That is most unusual. So it tells you that, yes, even though we believe that there may be political in instability. Africa as a continent with its leadership is committed to complying with global protocols relating to democracy. So I'm saying that, yes, you have a continent which has a, a landmass larger than US, China, India, Japan, and Europe put together, all right? A predominantly youthful population. What else? What else do we want? And I've been telling people that, look, if you are not careful, you're going to lose out. I don't know, well, whether politically, uh, it's, it's good saying this, but Look, China is all of Africa. Sometimes I hear complaints. <laughs> Look, yes, we need capital investment. I know that we we'll prefer dealing with other areas, Europe, UK, rather than the Far East, but we need capital, all right? We are still mineral rich. If the uh, companies in Europe and North America 
are not prepared to invest in our extraction of minerals. Why not? Whoever, whatever country is interested, we're going to give it, but ensure that we do it on terms favorable to us. So the opportunities are so great. And I'm just hoping that in the coming years, in the coming years, we are going to see more private sector investment from Europe, North America, and Asia into Africa. And we're going to have a win-win situation. I'm home and I tell the young, up the youth, the youth in Africa, I said, look, well, our, our time is virtually tapering now. You <laughs> must inspire confidence. You must inspire confidence of the world in Africa. And I'm hoping that, well, in the next decade or so, we are going to see a new Africa. Africa is rising. Africa is gaining self-confidence. Africa is producing a breed of leadership that is prepared to search ahead and ensure that its citizens get the dividends of democracy. Definitely, I mean, those dark days of the past, I can tell you definitely, those dark days are over. But in going to Africa, just get, study the investment climate. And as I said, you have uh, an African diaspora spread over Europe and North, uh, North America, which is constantly dealing with uh, the Africans back home. And you send them, can get a sense. You have to contact the appropriate institutions. It's a shame. Sometimes uh, you get some people complaining about Africa. Somebody says he wants gold from Ghana and he was cont he contacted someone on the internet and said, I said, hey, can you come to the UK and say that you are buying gold and just buy it from individuals? No, it doesn't happen. So you try and contact the institutions, right? And uh, on the ground visits, uh, exploratory visits, okay? And if you want to engage people, you must ensure that you verify their management experience and the track record of companies because, before going into joint ventures. Somebody says, well, I wanted to enter into this business. This company uh, said it was ready and I transferred some money to them. I said, do you, I mean, did you go to the Registrar Generals, for instance, in Ghana? Did you contact the Ghana Investment, uh, you know, GIPC? I said, no. So you have to make sure that you undertake your due diligence. And if you want to invest in certain areas, I mean, I can say that, look, uh, agri and agri processing, fantastic in Africa with the landmass and the weather conditions. So these are the opportunities, right? And your investment will be safe. I know that sometimes uh, we are slow. Sometimes we get unduly head back by bureaucracy. But despite everything, I believe that the opportunities far, 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 far outweigh the challenges that we we'll have to go through. There's so much money doing nothing. I mean, here the interest rate is virtually zero in Europe and America. Sometimes it's negative. Invest in Africa. There's no way you won't get a dividend or a return on your investment. Africa is the continent of the future. And I'm proud to say that Africa is in the cusp, cusp of a significant renaissance. 
I tell you. So for me, there's more work to be done. However, the time is now. And let's help ourselves as Africans first and let others also come and invest. It's not giving out charity. We are now talking about trade and not aid. And that's what we want. So I'll just conclude by thanking you, Adua, for this event. But as I always say, having been in UK for even a short while of three years, I said, oh, please. We can't just be talking and talking and saying the same thing over and over and over again, like a broken record. We just need to move ahead with confidence and act. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Adua. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency uh, Papa Owusu Ankuma. That's the Ghana High Commissioner for the UK and Ireland. That was a powerful speech, and and thank you for for that for that speech. We do need to uh, make a move um, as Africans. Um, like you said, we don't just need to be talking, but and I think a lot of the the work relies on the diaspora. Uh, it, it will take the diaspora to help change uh, the continent. Thank you for that. I've got some questions coming in, and I'm going to go straight to. Uh, Honorable uh, Lord Boateng, uh, the first question I have for you is how can Africa take advantage um, of the opportunities that have been brought about as a result of Brexit? And so that is your question. Brexit presents a real opportunity, presents a real opportunity for, for Britain uh, and uh, for, for Africa. And I think it's very important to see this in the context of the Africa free trade area. Uh, it's very important also and importantly to see this as an opportunity uh, to improve the terms of trade between Africa uh, and the UK to create a, a, a model for pro-poor investment uh, on the continent. Uh, investment that creates jobs because that is uh, the key uh, to the future of uh, the continent. Uh, the government of Ghana has recognized this uh, with its focus on manufacturing and uh, industrialization. We have to move from subsistence agriculture and extractives towards other high value, tradable and labor intensive industries. Uh, and we need, importantly, uh, to encourage uh, UK investment uh, in uh, uh, Africa and in, in Ghana. We need also to do, uh, and I think the High Commissioner has really blazed a trail during his time. He refers to uh, three short years, but there have been three very productive years in which His Excellency has uh, really developed a relationship with the investment community in the UK, with the London Stock Exchange, and a relationship also, and importantly, and he's made reference to this, with the diaspora. You know, there's a reason why the Africa Union recognizes the diaspora uh, as a specific constituent part uh, of, uh, of Africa. And that is because we have yet to sufficiently and adequately mobilize remittances uh, and the skills, capacity, and expertise that exist in the diaspora community in relation to, uh, to uh, the uh, continent. Uh, and the reconfiguration uh, of trading relationships uh, in the world, which Brexit is, is part of, uh, gives us an opportunity to tap into those external sources uh, of foreign direct investment, uh, but at the same time to uh, recognize that there is a job of work to be done about mobiling internal, uh, mobilizing internal uh, resources in order to improve capacity and productivity uh, on the continent. But in terms of foreign direct investment, you know, we shouldn't forget what the statistics tell us 
uh, that returns on foreign direct investment in Africa have been robust. They average 6.5% in the last year for which we have statistics compared to 6.2% in Latin America and the Caribbean and 6% uh, uh, and 5.3% uh, in, in South Asia. So there's a good return on investment in Africa. And what we have to do, and it's a partnership between the private sector and public sector, it's a partnership also between, between nations, uh, what we have to do is to create an environment, an enabling environment in which we build on those returns in a way that creates jobs and opportunities uh, on uh, the continent. And let me just give you an example, a recent example of UK investment in, in Africa in the light of uh, COVID. It was uh, the UK uh, that invested in that uh, COVID-19 uh, testing kit that I referred to earlier on. It did so in conjunction with the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, 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 Foundation. And I think we need more examples of this. And we also need to see, and it's already happening uh, in relation to a number of COVID-19 funds that have been set up by African uh, uh, governments, we need to see African philanthropists step up to the plate in this regard, because there are some great African philanthropists, and there are also some real sources of potential philanthropic uh, wealth on the continent itself. You know, we mustn't, and I think uh, His Excellency, the President of Ghana, made this point very, very effectively uh, in uh, his uh, dialogue with uh, the President uh, of France. You know, Africa, Ghana, is not looking for handouts. It's not looking for handouts. Uh, we are looking for partners who will together give all of us uh, a hand up. It's a win-win situation uh, for Africans uh, and for uh, the wider world in terms of investment in the continent. And Brexit is just one avenue of opportunity in that regard. Right, Honourable Lord Popoatin, for that answer. I am going to go uh, straight also to, I've got a question uh, for His Excellency, Papa Usu Ankuma, and the question that I have for you is, what um, can government do to ensure that the private sector no longer remains shy in terms of tackling um, some of these issues that we've mentioned? What can we do to ensure that the private sector come forward, they don't remain shy and stay at the back? Well, um, you, Excellency. well uh, I don't know whether you're talking about the private sector in UK or the private sector in Africa generally. However, I would say that the private sector always takes a lead from government. And I would say that in the case of uh, the UK and Africa, We've seen recently the UK making serious efforts to win the confidence of Africa. And individual, individual countries in Africa are also making an effort to deepen economic ties with the United Kingdom. Ghana, for instance, has set up a a UK Ghana Business Council. I mean, it's headed in the case of Ghana on its part by the Vice President, who's the chair of the economic management team. And in the case of the UK, it's always headed by the minister, either for Africa or Minister for International Development. And we meet twice a year. And the UK uh, export finance you know, just even recently held a webinar letting us know the opportunities available for the UK export finance to support private sector investment with uh, where UK sources about 20% with funds. So we see these are uh, as 
positive, positive steps. But I say that there's also something more we need to do. I gave the example of blue skies, which is the largest uh, investment in large scale agriculture in Ghana. And it's a joint venture between UK firm and a Ghanaian firm. And in Africa, in Ghana, we're talking about opportunities. We are saying that, look, in the case of pharmaceuticals, for instance, that's what we've been trying to do, get global firms, right? With global reputation to invest in pharmaceutical production in Ghana with Ghanaians, because we, they've demonstrated that when it comes to pharmaceuticals, one of the greatest in Africa. So these are the opportunities that are available with Brexit. We are now talking about agricultural products. You know, the UK should be entering trade agreements with Africa. It's always been a debate. If we don't do it, it means that the tariffs or even agricultural products will be about 20%. And it's a challenge. It means that we can't export. But we're saying that if Brexit provides an opportunity for Africa, then Africa should not be worse off in terms of its trade relations with the, with the UK after exiting, so that at least let the terms be at par with the terms that Africa has with EU. But to make it more attractive, let the terms be better. That's what we're talking about. And that's what we are seeking to negotiate. So the private sector should also be talking about, it should be linking up. I can talk about Ghana, where we've brought the private sector in pharmaceuticals, for instance, in garments to come to the UK, deal, look at the big, big firms that deal in the garments, that is closing, the few firms that deal in ph pharmaceuticals, trying to see if we can get them together. But all you know, the private sector should not be shy. I always say that when it comes to the private sector in the UK, it seems they are super shy when it comes to Africa. They are not super shy when it comes to Asia and uh, Latin America. But we are, we are, we are, it's, it's, it's work in progress. But I dare say, I will say that we as Africa should be responsible for our own destiny. I mean, that is why the president of Ghana says that, look, now we want an Africa beyond it. We must have opportunity access to UK markets. If it's a question of standards that uh, we cannot meet, then of course we need technical support, particularly for, for our SMEs, so that they can gain access to the UK market. Adjoa, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency, um, Papa Ousu Ankuma. That, that, that's brilliant. Um, our time is up. It's 12.31. Really? And so we know... <laughs> really? We've been speaking for an no hour. Wow. <laughs> there, there, there are questions. questions. We've, we've got some questions. We've got two more questions, but the next session is starting in the next um, nine minutes, and they will be at the back end. Uh, so 
well, I'm going to round up and I will probably reach out to you guys uh, with some of the questions uh, via email and we will try yeah. to include those answers in our summaries yeah. that's going out to the audience. Sure. So I'd like to say thank you very much once again. Right Honorable uh, Lord Paul Boating, it's been an absolute honor to have you here. And also Your Excellency Papa Ousu and Koma, it's an absolute honor to have both of you here and to have this kind of co this conversation. Um, I'm excited about the future of Africa and I believe that we are on our way to changing the narrative of the continent. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Ajo, for having us. Thank, Thank you, Ajo. Your Excellency. Bye-bye.